If you recall, there's a lot of things that we need to get through in this chapter. We've got two pages of objectives here. We began this chapter speaking about what the functions of money are, what the definition of money is. We kind of define de- uh, money in terms of its functions. Talk about four functions. There's three primary functions. The things that operate or that circulate as money in the economy are either currency or deposits. And there are different measures of the amount of money in the economy. Those measures go from more liquid to less liquid. And as you go from more liquid, you move from medium of exchange to less liquid, which is more store of value, functions of money. There was a question about the functions of money, which we've spoken about, and a second one about the functions of money. We then moved on to discussion about the different types of actors in in the money market. Mostly we're going to be concerned with banks. Uh, And what is the objective of a bank? What is a firm? It's going to make profit. How is it going to make profits? It's going to lend money to people and it's going to uh, accept deposits, savings deposits. It's going to pay interest rates on those deposits. It's going to charge interest rates on the loans. And the interest rate differential is how the bank makes its profits. Okay, that it's like an, a kind of an arbitrage that they do. Um, so, why do we want to use these institutions? These are called intermediaries. Why do we have these intermediaries? They perform a bunch of functions and essentially they lower the risks and the costs of borrowers, or sorry, the risks and the costs of lenders lending to borrowers. Okay? It also reduces the costs to borrowers as well. It's a very highly regulated industry and it has a lot to do with uh, the stability of the economy. The Reserve Bank at this point in time or should we say over the last couple of years, has integrated into its mandate a, a, a focus on something called financial stability as opposed to just price stability. So the, the mandate of the Reserve Bank is price stability. Uh, how it achieves price stability is up to the Reserve Bank. The way that it does that at this point in time is through inflation targeting. And part of inflation targeting, um, was, so inflation targeting is, is one focus, And then they've got another focus which they've started taking um, over the last few years, which is a focus on financial stability. So it starts looking at things like asset prices and uh, what's happening on stock markets. We spoke about the central bank. The central bank is the the thing that's the, the entity, the body that regulates the banking sector. It also performs uh, a couple of other functions. Those functions, if we can just recap them over here. They are in charge of formulating and implementing monetary policy. We haven't spoken about what monetary policy means yet, but we will. They issue the notes and coins that circulate. So there's a company uh, in the Reserve Bank called the Mint, and the Mint makes the coins. And there's another company, and I think it's called the Banknote Company. And yeah, that one makes the banknotes. All right. Uh, it's, they supervise the banking cent- sector. They ins- sorry, I say they. It, the Reserve Bank ensures the effective functioning of the payment system, so that's through maintaining price stability. They act as a banker for the government as well as something called a lender of last resort. So lender of last resort has a lot to do with this idea of uh, price and financial stability and the effective functioning of the payment system. Um, lender of last resort, are you guys familiar with what that means? Not really? So, you know, recently there was the public protector's report, uh, uh, Nkobani um, released that report about the Reserve Bank where it said, okay, the Reserve Bank must change its mandate, okay? And part of that report was also an investigation into a bailout for something called Bancorp. 
Any, any knowledge of this? No? Okay. So, topical at the moment, because again, this was in the public protector's report, it's a highly politicized issue. And what happened in the 1980s was the Reserve Bank bailed out something called Bank Corp. Bank Corp was then purchased by ABSA. And Kobani said that ABSA must pay back any money that was used to bail out Bank Corp because the way that the Reserve Bank did that was, I don't know exactly what her terminology was, but essentially she was saying the Reserve Bank shouldn't have done that. Okay? What, what M. Kobani doesn't seem to have understood about that process is exactly what the Reserve Bank is supposed to do as a lender of last resort. So what a lender of last resort does, when you have a bank in trouble, is to make sure that whatever trouble that bank is in doesn't spread to any other banks. Okay? If that trouble spreads to any other banks, the entire banking system can collapse. If the banking system collapses, the payment system collapses, the economy takes a big hit. It's really, it's, it's a big problem. So part of the financial crisis in the US, 2007-2008, the reason that that crisis was such a big crisis was because the entire banking system basically seized up. Okay? When the banking system doesn't operate properly, the economy doesn't operate properly. So what happens with a bank? Uh, we spoke last week, I think, about the difference between an insolvent bank and an illiquid bank. Okay? So an insolvent bank means that the value of the assets is less than the value of the liabilities. Okay? In other words, if you were to sell off all those assets, you wouldn't be able to cover the costs of all the liabilities or everything that you owe to other people. You don't have enough assets to pay all the people that you owe. You are insolvent. Okay? The other issue of illiquid is when your short-term assets are less than your short-term liabilities. In other words, your assets might be larger than your liabilities, but the assets that you have available to turn into cash right now are less than the liabilities that you need to pay out in cash right now. Right? So the way that companies deal with that is they, they have to take out you know, um, facilities that enable them to cover short-term liabilities if they need to. And they would use, they'd use a bank to do that. But when a bank has that problem, right, it, the only bank it can go to is the reserve bank. Okay? So the idea of the lender of last resort is for the reserve bank to say to commercial banks, right, if you need short-term assets right now because your short-term liabilities are larger than your short-term assets, um, well, because your requirements, let's say the payouts that you need um, to make on your short-term liabilities are larger than the, the cash reserves you've got right now, we will make cash reserves available for you. Basically, what you do is you sell in something called a, a repurchase agreement. You sell assets to the reserve bank. The Reserve Bank gives you cash. Because you've now got cash, you can meet any short-term liabilities you have. Once you've got over any problems you had trying to meet your short-term liabilities, you then have to arrange with the Reserve Bank to buy back the assets that you sold initially. Okay? So the Reserve Bank provides liquidity to the banking system in something called lender of last resort. Okay? Of course, if the bank is insolvent, then the Reserve Bank has a bigger problem because the bank itself can't carry on operating. So then the Reserve Bank usually intervenes to try and stop that insolvent bank causing problems throughout the entire banking system. Because all banks tend to lend to one another. So if one bank goes under, it affects the balance sheets of all the other banks. The values of their assets fall, and if the values of their assets fall, they have the potential to become insolvent too. So the Bank Corp story was essentially the Reserve Bank getting involved in what was ultimately an insolvent bank and preventing a, a financial meltdown, basically. Um, Kobani did not seem to understand that that was the story. 
But again, her, her findings have been challenged and they'll probably be overturned soon. I think that, that court case happens in September. So the first part of Nkwavani's report was overturned and the, the second part which has to do with uh, the loan to bank call will probably be overturned as well. So not a, good, not a good day in the office for her. And that's what a lender of last resort does. We spoke about tools of the South African Reserve Bank and we ended on this question here. And this question here was related to this diagram here, which is a description of one of the tools of the Reserve Bank. So what we'll do today is we'll just begin with discussing the tools of the Reserve Bank, go through that question again, and then continue with some new stuff. Any questions at this point? You guys happy? Cool. As long as you're not saying no, then I guess it's good enough. So the Reserve Bank has three t policy tools. Okay. So remember its mandate, what does it want to try and do? Maintain price stability. Okay. How does it maintain price stability? By using three policy tools. We haven't seen how it uses those tools yet. First, we're just talking what, about what the tools are. The first of those tools is the required reserve ratio. The second is the repo rate. And the third is something called open market operations. With the required reserve ratio, what that means is all banks need to keep a certain amount of cash on reserve with the reserve bank. Okay? When banks get, we're going to talk today about how banks make, um, how banks create money, or shall we say, in, yeah, create money is, you can use that terminology. It's not ideal, but it's what the textbook refers to. So a commercial bank can create money by granting loans. The amount of loans that a bank can create is, re is determined by the reserve ratio. And we'll see how that works in a moment. The repo rate is the rate at which commercial banks can borrow from the Reserve Bank. So remember, I just explained to you now that a commercial bank can sell assets to the Reserve Bank and then agree to buy those assets back. That, agree that whole arrangement is called a repurchase agreement. And the repurchase rate the short name for the repurchase rate is the repo rate. Okay, so repo stands for repurchase. So by changing the repo rate, the Reserve Bank can change the cost at which banks can borrow from the Reserve Bank. And by changing the cost of borrowing, the Reserve Bank can basically control how much commercial banks are going to lend to other banks. Um, uh, individuals. And again, we'll see how that happens in a moment. The third tool is the open market operations. What is the open market operations? Well, that was what this diagram was showing. The open market operation is when the Reserve Bank goes into the bond market and either purchases or sells government bonds. When it purchases or sells bonds through the open market, it will it changes the structure of banks' balance sheets because the, when it purchases those bonds and if it purchases them, whether it purchases them from the general public or whether it purchases them directly from a bank, the result is the same. If it purchases them from a bank, what will happen is any government, um, any uh, securities that the bank itself held decrease and the amount of cash available to that commercial bank increases. And because the amount of cash that the bank has available increases, the amount of loans the bank can make increases. So if it can make more loans, it can create more money, the, the commercial bank. So let's, we'll come back to all three of these um, tools. We will come back to this question as well. But first, I want to talk a little bit more about how a bank creates money 
and then we'll come back and look at all three of those tools. Okay? So that we understand how those tools influence the banks, the commercial bank's ability to create money. So remember deposits. Deposits are part of our money supply, right? So what banks can do is they can create deposits by making loans. Okay? We're going we're gonna to see over here a number of ways in which we can show this diagrammatically. We've got this kind of weird circle thing here. We've got this, I don't know what to call this, like tower looking thing. We've got an equation. We've got some other equations as well. So first we're going to just discuss it and then we're going to look at it diagrammatically and we're going to look at it, the maths involved as well. So how do banks create money? Most money is in fact deposits. Okay? Most of the money measure M1, M2, M3, most of that is deposits. Cash is only a very small percentage of the circulating money in an economy. And what banks create are deposits. And they make deposits, and they create these deposits, sorry, by making loans. So if, for example, you swipe your credit card, what tends to happen is you, when you swipe your credit card, are essentially taking out a loan with your bank. So what will happen is you, as the buyer, when you swipe your credit card, you are the buyer, you take out a bank loan, and at the same time, the, per the person that you are buying from, the seller, will have a bank deposit num Their bank deposit number will go up. So if you sell something and someone buys it with a credit card, when they swipe their credit card, your bank balance goes up, your deposits go up, and they take out a loan from the bank. It's a very short-term loan on a credit card, usually. Well, if it's not a short-term loan, you're doing it wrong. I'm not a financial advisor. I cannot give you any financial advice, but I'll tell you that. Yeah. If you're financing things on a credit card, it's not a good way to do things. So, if a bank can just make a loan and that makes the money supply increase automatically, what stops banks from just making as much money as they want, right? I mean, they can just give loans to anyone that they want to and it will make deposits go up. Money supply goes up. Once you've got that positive deposit value, you can go and spend it wherever you want, right? So what stops banks from just making as many loans as they want, okay? There are three factors that limit the quantity of deposits that the banking system can create. In other words, the amount of loans that the banking system can extend. The first has to do with something called the monetary base. The monetary base is all the bank notes and coins in circulation as well as held in deposit by commercial banks at the Reserve Bank. In other words, any cash or coins that the Reserve Bank has put into the economy, right, which is either held by commercial banks as reserves or is held by you know, us in our wallets, that's called the monetary base. Now, the size of the monetary base limits the total quantity of money that the banking system can create. And we're going to see why in a moment. So the first thing is the monetary base. The second thing is something called desired reserves. And desired reserves is very similar to required reserves, but slightly different. Okay? So a bank is going to keep on reserve some amount of cash. Okay, it needs to keep cash on reserve. Why does it need to keep cash on reserve? Because remember, if you have a bank deposit at the bank, you can go to the bank whenever you want to and just to ask them to give you cash. That's what a bank deposit, a demand deposit means. It means you can go to the, cash, the, the, the bank whenever you want and say, please give me cash. Normally, you don't speak to the bank. You just go to an ATM, you swipe your card, and cash comes out, right? In order for you to get that cash, the bank itself has to have cash to give you, right? So the bank needs to keep a certain amount of cash available in order to give you cash if you want cash. 
And remember this idea of liquidity, short-term assets, short-term liabilities, right? If your short-term liabilities are that everyone wants cash, you need to have enough short-term assets in the form of cash to give to those people that want cash. If you don't, what happens? You are illiquid, and as a bank you then have a problem. What do you then have to do? Go to the Reserve Bank, sell some assets to the Reserve Bank, borrow money from the Reserve Bank, and let those people take their, um, their, withdraw their money, right? But it costs you to borrow money from the Reserve Bank. Remember, there's something called the repo rate. Every time you borrow money from the Reserve Bank, you've got to pay them the repo rate. So you don't want to have to pay the Reserve Bank the repo rate. So you want to try and manage how much cash you have available to give to people when they want it, right? Of course, keeping cash also costs you as a bank because what could you be doing with that cash? Investing it and earning a return, right? So as a bank, you're stuck you know, between a rock and a hard place. You've got to have cash if people want cash, right? People come, they want cash, you've got to give it to them. That's what you agree. That's what a demand deposit is. But if you hold too much cash, it costs you money because you can't invest it. If you hold too little cash, it costs you money because you've got to borrow from the Reserve Bank, right? So you want to try and find that sweet spot. How much cash do we need to hold? That's called your desired reserves. That's how much you want to hold as a bank you, to, to make sure that you can run your business properly and get the most profits. So banks' actual reserves consist of the bank notes and coins in its vaults and its deposits at the Reserve Bank. The desired reserve ratio is the ratio of reserves to deposits that a bank wants to hold. Okay? So reserves, the amount desi desired reserves is the amount of cash. Okay? That cash is called reserves. Cash as a percentage of your total deposits. How much cash do I want to hold? How much cash do I think people are going to want on any given day? That's what I need to keep. Uh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. So why do people, in fact, themselves want to hold cash, right? So yeah, we want to hold cash because we want to buy stuff with cash, right? And we can hold cash either, sorry, we can hold money either as cash or we can hold it as bank deposits. And the proportion of money that is held as cash is not necessarily constant at any given time. People have a definite view as to how much they want to hold in the form of cash. So sometimes we just want to hold cash because you've got to use cash for some reason, right? To buy stuff because the deposit doesn't always work. So because households and firms want to hold some proportion of their money in the form of cash, when the total quantity of bank deposits increases, so does the quantity of cash that people want to hold. Okay? In other words, if you get paid as a bank deposit, you're probably going to withdraw some of that deposit as cash. Some of it you will leave as a deposit, some of it you will make payments by EFT or by transferring money as a deposit directly, but some of it you're just going to withdraw as cash. Okay? So that's why the bank needs to hold cash. Uh, and because desired cash holdings increase when deposits increase, there's always cash that leaves the banking system when loans are made and when deposits increase. And we call the leakage of cash from the banking system the currency drain. Okay? So let's look at what happens when, for example, the Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank prints money, for example. Okay? So it increases the monetary base. The Reserve Bank prints money e.g. print money. Okay? When the Reserve Bank prints money, it can use that money to conduct open market operations and buy securities from banks, as an example. Okay? When it buys those securities, what ends up happening? Those banks end up with more cash. Because they've got more cash, their reserves go up, 
And if they, remember, they want to manage their reserves, right? They don't want to have too much reserves. They don't want to have too little reserves. That's what a bank wants to do, right? It wants to find that sweet spot. So as soon as it gets too much cash, it's got what's called excess reserves. Excess reserves means it's got too much cash. Okay? It should be doing something with that cash rather than just holding it on its balance sheet. And what do banks tend to do with their excess reserves? They, they lend that cash to people. Okay? Why do they lend it to people? Because as soon as you lend money to people, they're going to pay you back with interest. So your money is working for you as a bank when you lend that money to people, right? So excess reserves means banks lend those excess reserves. When they lend those excess reserves, what happens? It increases deposits. Because remember when banks grant loans, right? People spend those loans and they end up back as deposits back in the money in back in the banking system. Okay? So when, after the bank lends its excess reserves, the quantity of money increases. Once the quantity of money increases, right? What do we mean by that? It means we've got new deposits. Sorry. We've got new deposits. If there are new deposits, okay, in other words, people take that money and they deposit it back at the bank, what ends up happening? Well, money is actually deposited at the bank and the bank once again has excess reserves. But the amount of excess reserves that the bank holds after it's lent money and money has been deposited back is much less than what the initial excess reserves were. Why? Because of two things. Some money gets held by the public. That's the currency drain that we just described. And also remember some of the reserves the bank wants to hold in case people want to withdraw cash. As soon as its deposits go up, it wants to hold more cash aside just in case anyone wants to in, in case someone wants to withdraw some of that money. So there's a desired reserve and a currency drain that the, that the bank, that leaks essentially out of the bank's ability to make another loan from its excess reserves once money has been deposited, redeposited after its initial lending. So what do we end up with? We end up with this diagram. Oops. We end up with this diagram which is on page 500 and, sorry. Page 568. 